I need to get a fan in here. Hey, there we are. We are live. Hello, everybody. I'm Trevor. And I'm Tom. This is Agency Accelerator, the show where we talk about how to launch your agency and scale it. Quickly! Because we're accelerating it, you see. If you have an agency that's doing less than a million a year, good news. We're <clears throat> in the trenches and built, going our business through that size, too. Listen in if you want to accelerate your agency and pick some tips up from myself and Trevor, because we've been here before. We've run agencies, big and small, exited, and here we are, doing it again and helping you get through it. Awesome. I'm the old grumpy one. Tom is the not-so-old pleasant one. And today's episode is all about hiring tactics, because we've both done a lot of hiring. I was thinking in the pre-show, trying to think, between all the various jobs I've worked over the years, I've probably hired more than 200 people. Um, and uh, not fired anyone near that many, which is good because my soul would carry that burden. Uh, but we were talking a month or more ago about hiring, and Crowd Tamers is a fully remote company, and we were talking about business and margins and playing and all these things. And you went, Trevor, you think it's a mistake for me to not hire aggressively globally? And I just said yes. And it's very rare to get a one-word answer from you. Yeah, <laughs> you did, and I was like, ooh. Hiring globally, I'm really doing something wrong here. And and to be fair, we do have a, a couple of people internationally that we have hired, but it's much more in a uh, full-time consultant capacity, right? It's not That's so it. much in uh, an ad hoc, you know, uh, person here, person there in all these different countries. Um, just the nature of our business kind of requires us to have people working in the same time zone. So time zone aside, right? Hiring where I'm in uh, East Coast time right now on in, in the US. So um, really, I have my pick, right? Uh, North and South, uh, all these different countries that we could engage with. Um, we just haven't yet for one reason or another. You know, we've had the same staff on uh, at X-Ray for the last almost two years at this point. Um, and we are gearing up for a very aggressive 2024, um, which is what prompted the question, right? Should we yeah. be hiring internationally to help make those steps up in the agency life a little bit easier? Yeah. And so I think there's a couple decision matrices you have to juggle to figure out, am I hiring local? Am I hiring globally? One of the first things you do have to ask is, are you... Do you have an in-person office presence culture? Because mm. if you do, like the last company I worked at uh, here in Montreal, the CEO was adamantly opposed to working remote because he's like, in-office culture matters a lot. And then the pandemic happened. So, you know, sad trombone to everybody because he didn't get what he wanted anyway. But if you're not it's usually in-office culture oriented, then I think you could start to say, okay, well, what other opportunities are available to me? Yeah, and, and, you know, I think the international talent is probably no different or unqualified or less qualified than your local talent pool, right? Smart people are everywhere. Um, people that have the internet have access to learn things on the internet. So there's really no reason to assume that only the smart people that work for your business um, could, you know, be geographically close to you. Um, X-Ray was also a, a fully remote company from the start. So um, we've got people all over the US uh, and a couple, you know, a couple in Germany, a couple in Portugal, uh, just different places around the world. But at the end of the day, smart people are all over the planet. So you've got to kind of look around to figure out, you know, could those people actually be um, qualified enough to help you with your company? But before you even worry about hiring global talent, like as an as an agency, right, when you are ready to hire or you think you're ready to hire, how do you know that you're actually ready to hire somebody? And is it is it irresponsible to just put out an open open message for anyone on the internet? Hey, I'm hiring. Uh, do you go through friends of friends? You know, what 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 types of uh, channels do you find? Um, that you can trust the, the next hire that you have, especially with such a small company, right? We're talking under 10 people um, or between 10 and 20 or between uh, 20 and 30. Like those early hires still really, really matter. Um, how do you know what, who the right person is or, or that you're really ready to support another person added to the team? Yeah. So there's a, a lot of pieces in that question. One of the first thing I think is, how do you know when you are ready to hire? And when you hire, one of the things that can de-risk the hiring decision 
it's either to say, look, I'm going to engage somebody part time, whether it is remote or in, you know, in your same geo. I'm going to engage somebody part time with the hope it expands to full time. I think contract that is, to hire. yeah, contract to hire. It can be a responsible way to do things mm -hmm. um, in for a couple different reasons, right? The um, a lot of folks who are like I've, I've been seeing layoffs just going nuts everywhere, right? And to yeah. say to somebody, look, I can't afford. Like you worked for Spotify, you got fired. You worked for Ubisoft, you got fired. Whatever. You have great experiences. I would love to have you as part of what I'm doing. I can't afford to pay you what you were making before. But work for me for five months, four months, whatever. And if it grows, then maybe you see more what you what you used to see. It gives them an opportunity to cushion the fact that suddenly they're jobless and they're going into Christmas and it's all poop. Uh, and lets you try folks out for an extended duration or just get help somewhere where you don't really need a full-time person. Yeah. And that, either way, beneficial. Or you hire somebody remote, you know, you find a cheaper economy, and you can get really good people for half time at, you know, a thousand bucks a month. And it is rare in a business that's any appreciable scale that you can't afford a thousand bucks a month to see if this thing that you think someone should own is ownable, mm -hmm. you know, a, you know, a, a minimum viable hire format. And if you're wrong, they will contract, whatever you part your ways. And if they're, if you were right, you bring on full, full time. So I, that flexibility and the fact that the job market is accepting of that now is a really good way in my mind to figure if you need to hire. I actually made a mistake last year. My agency did really well. We've talked about it. I did 700 ish K um, for the year. I hired a PM to help the company build and grow and scale. Uh, and then the recession or whatever we're not calling the economic situation we're in right now hit. And just I made less every month from October of 2020. To, to June of 2023. And I was like, I hired someone local in Canada because I wanted to have somebody who both understood all the cultural context and also I could use as a reason why I should get a permanent residency here in Canada. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then it ended up just like the cost was really high. And then when she got offered a chance to work somewhere else, she jumped and took it because the business was obviously like I thought I was going to hire her and grow revenue up from there. Instead, I hired her and revenue shrunk every month after she joined. So if I'd been smarter and said, hey, let me bring on somebody part-time, right, to do PM work, AM work mm -hmm. for me, half-time. And then I discovered, oh, you know, October, November, December, January, I've made less money every month. I could have said, hey, you're great, but we got to part ways. I wouldn't have felt the same burden. you got a full-time yeah. employee. You've got to keep them on. It's not their fault. They took a jump on you. Like yeah. That's something else is it's, it's easy to, as a CEO, like you have responsibility for your people. It's not just like it's a purely business relationship. When you're a new company, they're taking a chance on you. You've got to honor that. Yeah. And, and, you know, finding the right person who is technically capable of doing the work is one layer to the equation, right? Like, can the job get done? Yes or no. That's, that's one aspect of it. But no matter how much preparation you actually have for this job role, there's going to be things that you forgot to write down to prepare them for. And there's going to be a real, uh, a real opportunity for that new hire in a contract or full-time employee context to see them own the processes and own the things that, that they're then responsible for and improve them. Mm -hmm. And from what I've found, starting in a contract to hire sort of track for, for somebody lets you not only align on the work and the quality that needs to get done, but also on the culture, right? Does it make sense to in, involve this person? Do we believe the same things? Do we uh, feel passion about the aspects of the job that need to get done? And, and, and do you enjoy the work? And what happens when you find that person that actually gels in that type of way, on a cultural way for, for the company, new things come out of that relationship that go way beyond the one or two or 10 things that you put on their checklist to do every day. Um, yep. it, it builds the company. And that's one of, I think, the biggest aspects of 
you know, the founder, like the founder's burden. How do I give autonomy to these other people that I'm going to to bring into the company and really make it about them and enable them? Uh, you know, one of the, the best sayings a mentor of mine uh, shared with me is good managers know when to help. Great managers know when to get out of the way. And if you find the right people that you can get out of the way for, then that's a huge sign that that contractor should probably be an employee. Because if you can enable them and they can just run and do a better job than you, then you're finding the right people. Um, but you got to try them out first. And, and you've got to be transparent and honest with the type of work that you want them to do. Yeah, that is um, one of the ways I know I need to hire somebody. Is I've, I've showed before on stream, right? I've got my list of SOPs. Mm. And if I've got a whole area of SOPs, that is at least 15 long, all buckets under one headline, and nobody really owns it, that means I'm stuck with it because the founder does everything that the other team members don't do. Yeah. And if I've got 10 or 15 SOPs that are all in a group and no other employee can own, I go, well, somebody should own this. And then you end up handing those SOPs off to somebody. And you say, great, this is, you know, week one of training is do all these, learn them. Beyond that, like an SOP is not a training doc. We've talked about that too. But yeah. getting at least that, right, all your SOPs also become a really easy job description. Do all the things I have in my SOP. And then once you've learned the basics, right, 30 days, 60 days, whatever, and you've learned the basics of all these SOPs, come up with all the stuff that I haven't thought about to make all this better. Right. And that's the next stage. And really, you know, somebody who you hire the first month or two months, they can follow steps. And that's about all you should expect from them because they're new. Mm -hmm. And then after that two months, three months, you give them room to innovate and grow. And that's when you really start to see what the potential of this person is. And then after about six months, when they really actually master the job, it takes a while to get into a new culture, a new work habit, a new everything, and be able to perform to your best. Trevor, have you ever heard of the term nose blind? Then you can't. No, like nope. Do you have? It, it, no, it refers know. to like a smell that you're maybe a candle's burning, and you've just been in the room long enough where you don't smell that smell anymore. Right? Ah, okay, got it. So that 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 term, right? I parallel that a lot to new hires and new people that you bring into the company you are effectively nose blind to the systems that you've surrounded yourself with. Yeah. And some new person that you're forced to teach and to show the guts of the internal processes that make the, the, the company run will look at it with fresh eyes. And you can't, no matter how much you pay somebody, no matter how many you know pe people that are on your team or whatever, you can't replicate a first perspective, a first time perspective for somebody walking in and saying, why is it like this? Right. And, and that's, I think one of the most valuable things in working with contractors generally, whether they rotate in and out or finding new people to add to your team, it's plucking out the one or two things that they see as a glaring juxtaposition or something that, that, that doesn't quite align for them because you're simply nose blind to it. You just, you're surrounded by it and you just don't know that this one little quirk actually doesn't make sense in the grand scheme of things. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity when, when you start getting a little overwhelmed with the amount of work that you have and you want to bring somebody in to, to help you. Their perspective is so pure, having not had all of the context that led you to where you are today. And that's going to be, I think, one of the really um, valuable aspects of just involving other people besides yourself and your immediate team. It's getting that fresh perspective and, and listening to what a first time perspective looks like. Yes. And that's where you, you inevitably discover the process cruft. That's mm -hmm. there because of reasons that don't exist anymore. Um, there's a story I remember from, I mean, when I was a kid, about a recipe for making a pot roast. And the first step was mm -hmm. cut off the end of the pot roast. And then you cook it and everything. And this woman who made this pot roast a half dozen times asked her mom, why don't you cut off the end? And her mom goes, I don't know. And her mom asks her mom, so the grandmother, why don't you cut off the end of the pot roast? And the grandma goes, oh, because when I was first doing this, the pot I cooked in was too small. You had to cut the end <laughs> off to fit it. And so like, 
And for 40 years, this was the habit they had adopted because grandma had a small pot, right? And it takes the daughter making this, I think for her daughter, right? A great granddaughter being like, why do this mom? And she goes, I, I, I don't know. Someone should ask. And they were able to actually ask the ancestor who was still around. So you'll find that process in your business where you go, why do you do this? Well, because in the software that we used to use, you had to do it this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, but maybe we could do better now. Well, that's a very good point. So I well, get it. Even es establishing that, that hiring process alone, mm -hmm. right? It's not, oh, I established it once. I set it and forget it. And we're going to hire the next 200 people the same way. That, right. that, that's not how this works, right? It, it's the first, I don't know, 10 days of a new hire being involved. They'll notice things. They'll be shown things. They'll be given things. They'll watch videos. They'll read documentation. But that's kind of the last time somebody's going to do it in that particular order for that particular role, right? Probably. If you hired somebody who's who's proactive, they're going to say, hey, I learned all these things. We should switch the order a little bit. This doesn't really make sense that you taught me, you know, at the end how to season something that I should have cooked, right? Like, like right. Th this is this is you know order of operations, and this is a continuous process. It's ongoing. Right. It's going to be refined again and again and again. And and my question to you, Trevor, is like, what what are the mechanics of your hiring process, and how do you evaluate two candidates against each other, um, or in conjunction with each other for the opportunity against the opportunity that you have? for them to, to actually do. What's your what's your process for hiring? So there are, I think, three big phases. And my company's still quite small. There's five of us. Company's still quite small. And so first phase is you job application out, right? Indeed, I mean, you could put it there. I'm not convinced I've ever found somebody I wanted to hire on Indeed. Um, back when WellFound was called AngelList, I got really good results with it. I haven't tried to hire in a year. I don't know if well-found is still the place to be. Um, but you go on well-found or LinkedIn or whatever, and you look for, well, I did was, I mean, I had a job post, that's fine, but I, you do outbound. Mm -hmm. I think everybody I've hired in my agency, with the exception of my media buyer, who I knew from a previous company, I went and said, hey, come apply because I have very specific things I want to see. And, you know, people in India, people in Africa, people in uh, wherever in Europe, my web dev is this week. I don't know. He travels a lot. He lives in a van um, by choice. He's not homeless. Um, and like all these people, um, I want, I, I have these skills I want and you, you seem to fit them. Mm -hmm. Outreach. Um, I don't use LinkedIn Recruiter because it's really expensive and you can, I mean, honestly, if I'm sending more than 20 or 30 outbounds a day, what am I doing with my life? Um, but find people who look like they fit and have your job post and people will apply. Sure, that's fine too. Um, then instantly when you apply, you get a, it's like a two sentence questionnaire, right? Mm -hmm. Give me a one sentence summary of what crowd teamers does. And why you want, why you think that your skills are good for what this company is? That's it. Ninety percent of people who apply will never answer that. Excellent. I don't have to talk to you. You're done. Right. This is all still the screening, and after that, then you do you, like it's a fifteen minute conversation. This is the first call. I don't like to have a long first call because honestly, a bunch of the people who I'm interviewing with in the first ninety seconds, I know if I don't want to hire you. Mm. And it's really rude to hang up in 90 seconds. That feels, even to, to my, like, I don't like people, that's an a-hole thing to do. But I feel like 15 minutes is enough where you can feel like, look, everybody got 15 minutes. It's very short. And then of those folks in the 15 minutes, probably, you know, let's say I do 100 people who I get an application from, 10 will actually answer the questionnaire. I'll talk to all 10. I don't really... I, don't really care what your answer is. I care that you answered it. Uh, then, okay, have a call, 15-minute call, just quick vibe check, right? Mm -hmm. If the vibe check is off, no thanks, buddy. Of those 10 who I talk to, maybe three mm -hmm. pass the vibe check, right? So of yeah. those three, then it will be to have a second more technical call. And then if you, and most folks are passing the technical call, right? You haven't failed the vibe check if you don't have the right skill. But still, I'll check. Uh, then it becomes meet the team, right? Because when you're in a small company, 
every hire is effectively a co-founder hire. Mm -hmm. And you have to fit. You have one drama queen. You have one person who loves to spread rumors. You have one person who immediate response to something is no. And it brings the whole thing down. Yeah. So that that's that's the aspect of culture that I was talking about before is yeah. like it, it's 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 a little bit more than a mindset and it, it really makes the difference between having a a trust among the team that's showing up every day and trying to get something done. Um, I, I appreciate that uh, that breakdown there, going from the you know the applicants to the interviews to you know uh, going into having team uh, team introductions. We do I, a I'm little... not there in the team intro, by the way. I say I tell the team like, intentionally. On the, I eat out, right? I'm like, look, if you want to talk crap behind my back, Meek is time. not in this call, right? Apollo is like, I've got no note taker in the call. You guys talk and say whatever you want about me because I won't know. And, and not everybody does that, but I, I think it's actually really important, right? Like yeah. you, you've got you've to trust your team enough to give them that freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as a new candidate, you'd want to see that freedom, right? You, you want to ask the questions, the awkward questions maybe is like, hey, you know, like does Trevor really show up at three o'clock in the morning to get on a call or do it? No, of course not. Like that's not whatever. But, but the, the, the point is the same. It's like, you got to create that environment where people can build a bridge of trust, mm -hmm. uh, especially when they're new coming into a circle of five people, seven people, 15 people that um, have done stuff together. And now there's this new person that you really got to count on uh, and everyone's communal success matters on that one person, right? This isn't a group project in high school. Like you can't just have Trevor doing all the work here and then everybody else gets to, gets to, uh, you know, get the A. Like it's not going to work like that. So having the environment set up where you can build that trust and allow people outside of the founders to, to create a culture and a trust among themselves. I think it's a, um, it's a critical aspect of, of any hiring process. Um, yeah. I do. I agree. That is, and, and it also speaks to the founder, right? If you say, "Hey, look, talk about why I'm not in the room," right? It gives you a view of the interviewee. Because interviews are two way streets, right? Definitely. You're looking at the company, or you should be, unless you're just completely effed and desperate for work. You're not going to take a job someplace that you're like, oh, "Those guys, they don't seem like a good company for me," right? Yeah. Um. And you as a founder are trying to sell the idea of working at your company to a good prospect, right? A good prospect should have other choices than you. And mm -hmm. you have to convince them that you're the best one to work with anyway. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the way that my old boss at Unito used to do it was he spent the first interview trying to convince you to work for the company and the second interview trying to convince you not to. I, I think that's a solid tactic, to be honest. Like, I, I think trying to convince somebody not to work at the company because, hey, you know what? Um, we we work on really hard problems, like really hard. Like you're going to talk to ChatGPT for hours to try to figure out how to do this thing, right? Or what, what, whatever it is. Whatever. Um, how bad do they want it? And how, bad, how, mu how much do they know about you or the company to stand their ground to say like, yeah, I, I like these problems, you know, bashing your head against the wall for, for this type of uh, technical issue is like my cup of tea. Um, not everybody feels that way. So uh, that negation, I think is, is a really nice way of balancing, um, you know, the, the honest conversations, right? Highlight yeah. the low lights and, and be very direct and, and honest about what the worst aspects of this job are, because sooner or later, they're going to find out. So they yeah. might as well find out about it from you. And, and if they do, they might trust you a little bit more and they might actually be prepared for those harder times uh, to be able to overcome them, innovate on them, improve them for the next person. Hiring isn't about necessarily that one person. Hiring is about creating a culture, creating a trust, creating a process that makes the overarching uh, process of creating value from that person easier going forward. Right. Everybody. It's like this new new person has has made the entire firm that much better. And every person after them should be better than them. 
and and in one aspect or another, or at least different, right? You don't want just the cookie cutter, same person going to copy and paste again and again and again. Um, you might have some great employees, but at the end of the day, it's diversity of thought that's really valuable um, yeah. and being able to create that culture that balances each other. Um, some of the best, honestly, some of the best people on my team, I've had big arguments with, and it's because we're passionate about it. It's because we care about the things it, that that's not a negative aspect at all. Like I'm so happy to surround myself with people that care enough to argue with me about it. And like, yeah. that's a thing you got to find because it's hard to find people that care enough to challenge. And, and, and that's, that's a cultural thing. You got to establish the openness, the willingness to engage in those types of dialogues, because at the end of the day, it's not about going left or going right. It's about finding that Goldilocks zone, wherever you need to be to deliver the most value that you as a team can deliver, not just you as an individual. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a, an interesting, uh, conversation and, and an interesting way to, to approach the problem. Um, yeah. so let me ask you, here. uh, You've got somebody, you've gone through the interview process. You mentioned yours is a bit different than mine. But at the end of interviewing, do you do a pilot or a test project? What do you have happen before you make any kind of offer? So there's, so I, I, I also start with a vibe check. Um, I start with sort of beliefs, uh, ideology. What is it that you, you really like uh, and really like? What are you trying to get out of this job, right? Like, it's not it's not about the paycheck. If it is about the paycheck, that's one thing. But is it about learning something specific? What skill do you want to add to your um, your tool belt, right? Over the course of your career, like, we're, wherever you're working, it's just you know they're not going to be with you for sixty years. Sorry, it's not 1940 anymore. Like, not anymore. I know, no. <laughs> right? So, so people are going to rotate in and out, and and be willing to accept that. But what is it about? this opportunity that can teach them something to help them feel like they're leveling up and how, to, how can you as an employer level them up as a person and as, as a, you know, a, a human capital talent. Um, so that's something that I really try to understand in the first interview is where are they today? Where are they trying to go and how can X-ray be a vehicle to help them get there? Um, assuming that checks out, then we'll move on to a technical challenge. Asynchronous, hey, here's a scenario, here's a technical problem, go solve it in uh, you know, an hour or two, something, something relatively small. It's most important to us to understand um, how they approach the problem, how they break it down, and what intentional, um, I'd say, intentional like aspects of their solution did they create right? Oh, you know, one, if this changes, the whole thing breaks. And I know about that. And I did that on purpose, right? And, and like, be able to talk through that technical um, environment that they end up developing. And then we go into contracting mode. And we say, all right, here is your opportunity. It's a one month project, a three month project, or whatever it is. And you're going to be client facing, not client facing, right? Put some bounds on on what aspect they're actually going to be involved in. And it's a real problem and you're really going to get paid and if things, things go well, we will talk about, you know, a more full-time employment. Uh, things don't go well. We have, you know, that, that release valve built in. We know how long it's going to be. We, we sort of have a backup plan internally. If that person doesn't perform the way that we want, um, you kind of, that, that's like the Goldilocks zone of knowing when to hire. It's like, we think we have a lot more work. It would be nice to hire somebody, but if they fail, we kind of have a backup plan. You, you kind of want to run those tracks at the same time because you don't want to be in a position where they can't deliver, this new new person can't deliver, and you don't have anyone internally to step in. Um, and then you have a bad, you know, an angry client that mm -hmm. that can really do some damage uh, to your public persona. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's important that you have that, that backup plan. Um, but yeah, we test them out. Throw, throw them, throw them in the deep end, right? Like let's, let's see you swim. Um, do you tend to have provide that support? just one person doing these projects? Do you have more than one person? Like how do you reach at the end of stage, uh, who you want to hire? Hmm. Um, so I skipped that part. Uh, it's, it's basically, it's basically like after the, the vibe check, um, and the technical challenge, uh, that's when, if they, they pass the technical challenge, we'll do team, team interviews. Um, and it's not, we actually don't do group team interviews, which after this conversation we might switch to doing. Cause I, I, I think that's 
probably more time efficient. Yeah. Um, right now we have one-on-one -on -one interviews. You got to meet mm -hmm. this person. You got to meet this person. You got to meet this person. Um, and allow them to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship force dialogue. Um, because at the end of the day, these are people that they are going to be working directly with. And mm -hmm. it's important that everyone has their own assessment and their own opinion that, yes, I trust that this person will deliver on what they say. At the end of the day, what do you say and what do you do? It's got to match. And, and that's what makes, you know, a, a really great person to build trust with. Um, so we'll, we'll end up having that group interview. And then we say, hey, we have this one opportunity on the hook. Um, who, who's, who are we going to give it to? Who are we going to bring in to, to do this? Because there's only going to be one person um, okay. out of, you know, a, a candidacy pool that will actually be given, you know, an opportunity to, to earn, you know, earn the, the uh, payment for that particular opportunity. And we can't employ everybody who applied, um, but we can certainly build a bullpen of people that are, are looking to do that. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons that we started Lookout Engineers, if I'm honest. It's, uh, you know, there's too many talented people Build to talent just thing. say, right, to, to say, uh, you know, everyone's going to be employed by X-Ray. Like, it's just not realistic. That's not, that's not the way that we're building um, X-Ray. So trying to find a soft place for everybody to land who, who wants to do this type of work, um, you know, but that's, it has nothing to do with agency acceleration, uh, unless you're looking for a uh, automation, uh, automation low code engineer here. Um, there there's go. a couple of those that are uh, that are on the site now that are just hanging out. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you don't hire principally remote, although you have hired some remote. Um, yeah. How do you do? So let's say you've got. Hey, I know I want to hire a new no code automa automator, somebody who can build. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you could pay seven uh, k a month or nine k a month, hire somebody in your Chicago land area, or you okay. can pay three k a month, two k a month, get somebody just as good in I don't know Argentina or in sure. uh, India or in Nigeria or in whatever. Um, how do you make that kind of hiring decision one that is responsible and fair? Hmm. Well, I, I, there's a couple different things in that question, right? Because it's not it's not just about the work, right? Right? It's like the work is is one thing. Sure, you know, you can look at Zapier or whatever certifications that people can get independently. Um, I think it's notoriously difficult to find net new people. Um, the majority of people involved in X rays orbit are, you know either past employees of somebody or a friend, a friend or a family member of somebody. It, it's, it's been, it's been an ever expanding circle of trust, right? That, that um, we can count on to, to get something done. But how do you go to those countries that you might not have a network in and find somebody that you can, um, you can actually hire? Uh, I think you ask your network directly, wherever your network is, because people are just intrinsically connected. Um, I think you ask your your trusted advisors or uh, people that you've worked with in the past, hey, I'm looking for somebody in this time zone or uh, that can work on this type of budget uh, to do this type of work. I think that's, that's the balance is transparently, openly having that dialogue with people that you can trust, that you know that you've trusted before uh, and hope that it leads you to a path that uh, lets you find somebody, somebody worth their salt. Um, that's certainly been a pattern that uh, I've lived by probably not quite hiring 200 people. I'd say closer to 50 um, that I've, I've hired over the, over my, my agency career. Um, but it's definitely one that has helped get through tougher times than, um, you know, just finding somebody in wherever to, uh, to, to go do a really specific job. Cause you just don't build the trust. You don't build a relationship. You're just like, I need this job done. And, and if it's just about that job, getting that job done, you know, find somebody on Fiverr, find somebody on low code engineers, find somebody, you know, uh, uh, just generally on the internet through Twitter. I mean, I, I've, I've built some real friendships over, over Twitter or whatever. Like you can, you can do that. Um, that tactic does work some percentage of the time, but you know, if this is a mission critical role and you know, it's a big opportunity that, you know, in your founding team, less than 20 people, you really want to make sure that there's 
a, a dimension of social connection beyond just a paycheck. I think that's the important part. That's interesting. Uh, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not the people person in this call. Uh, and everybody who I work with at Crowd Tamers who you know, I, um, I'm managing, uh, I mean, I knew, knew my media buyer from a different company. Everybody else I met when I said, hey, come work for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, I've got retention off the charts. I've never had an employee quit, except I guess when I got hired away. I had one employee quit. Um, of the, and she was my PM AM, who was kind of a, a, a fifth wheel anyway. Um, of the delivery team, my, my media buyer, my writer, my designer, like they've been there solid for two and a half to three years, which mm-hmm. for agency life is crazy. You it's a very expect, long retention. Yeah, yeah. 18 months is what you usually expect. Um, and there's a couple things I did because it, it's easy to say, oh, I'm paying somebody in, you know, Nigeria. I'll pay them a thousand bucks a month. They'll be happy with it. Um, and I'm able to build a business easily that way. Uh, and then capture, you know, crazy 90% margins and I get rich. Well, you can probably tell from my private bookcase behind me, I'm not that rich. But um, part of how I make it work equitably is. And I think in general, business owners should, if they are able to do this, is say, look, uh, the value that you generate when you work in a company has to be greater than what you're paid. That's literally how companies work. If you if you generate less value than you were paid, the company will go broke. But generally, unless you're a publicly traded company, there's no way to capture some of the value that you generated for your company. Just the people who are in charge get the money and you don't. Crowd teamers profit share. We profit share very, very generously. We take 28% of profits and share them, which is crazy high. Yeah, crazy high. Um, And that means when things were going really well last year, people's bonuses were paid quarterly and they basically get a fourth or even fourth and a half paycheck every quarter. Wow. Right? Big chunk of money coming their way, which evens out some of that income disparity. Let's me say, let me de-risk my hiring but then let me compensate them well if we succeed. Uh, also, not having the the sweatshop mentality. Don't overwork your people, whether they're remote or in person. But I, I have found a lot of people, whether they're remote just the next city over or they're remote nine time zones different. If you don't see them in the office, they're not a real person. It's easy to say, well, just work harder hmm. and... I mean, that's one, people will burn out. But two, it's just a bad way to treat people. Like uh, Tomas Holcher, who I do Raise to Launch podcast with, uh, he says a good CEO should only be about 50% busy. Once you're more than 50% busy. I do also think your team should only really be like 80% busy in general. Spec their work out to 35 hours a week or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And then say, beyond that, you know, have a life, do a side project. Um, for a while at Crowd Tamers, we were pushing really hard on everyone was getting certifications and education and learning and improving. And like I was paying a couple hundred bucks a quarter for everybody to take courses on Udemy and whatever. Um, any of these things, right? Improve your value. Done similar stuff, yeah. And then that helps also reduce the inequity because you're saying, look, you've got eight hours a week that you're being paid to be more competitive in the job pace for, place for your next job, right? That's also, that really helps balance that out. Um, what do you think, you've got some folks who are remote, you've got some folks who are in person. What do you think changes about how you onboard, bring in a new employee in a remote environment versus in a, hey, come down to the office, we'll hang out environment? <sighs> I think a lot changes. I mean, you, you lose, you lose a lot when you're not in person. I think everybody knows that, right? If I can't give you a hug, hello, like it's just a little different when I, you know, throw balloons up or something on a hug. Uh, hello. Heaven oh, help yeah. me. You're not, I mean, <laughs> Hey, it's not hugger? quite the same as, yeah, of course I'm a hugger. Uh, of course you're a hugger. Yeah, obviously. Um, I, I think you do lose, you lose a lot, but what it, what it forces you to do is create consistency and write stuff down. Uh, th- that's, that's the major difference in in-person and versus being fully remote is like, 
you're really going to miss a lot of those little moments where you would capture or at least observe firsthand what that uh, initial perception is that you get to see when someone discovers that something doesn't make sense or someone's learning a topic. Um, you're not going to be the one who can necessarily refine that uh, in a remote environment. That is really going to be a task, arguably the primary task, that you give uh, a new employee that's uh, remote. Is like, hey, I'm, I have a whole bunch of documentation, a whole bunch of things that I want to give to you, and I want you to, to learn. And also, please revise this list. Right. Please make it better because the next person that, that we're going to hire to do a project management role, to do a workflow consultant role, to do whatever, um, is going to have to have the same list and read through the same stuff and get familiar with it. And it would be real nice if they get your spark notes being a first time, you know, reader in this document. Um, I, I think too often, uh, agencies especially think, uh, or founders of agencies think that they know the best way to get a thing done, but it's really only directionally correct. You, you, you know kind of what the end goal should look like, but it's going to evolve. And the, the best edits that can be made to your process documentation or your onboarding documentation or whatever is going to be made by your next hire. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the best person to edit that document, not you. So I, I think that's a little bit of a, a difference from what the popular belief is, because a lot of founders like to be uh, heavy handed when it comes to the way things get done. Um, but in reality, it's all about delegating that ownership. Uh, and especially in the hiring process, there's going to be a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense to a person looking at it for the first time and listen to their voice, uh, because it is a unique perspective that you simply cannot replicate. Yeah. Fresh eyes are invaluable at spotting the the thing that everybody just ignores right yeah, where's so, Waldo? yeah that's, <laughs> that's a good point um all right so i think hiring like process uh i think ways to make it more equitable i think ways to make sure that you're you're building either a remote first or i think it's really hard to build a hybrid culture i think you can build remote first i think you can build in office i think a big part of the return to office push that's driving everybody who's been enjoying working from home crazy is it's very hard to have some in office and some remote because the folks remote end up getting excluded mind you a lot of people their job doesn't require being in on everything mm -hmm. but then the manager goes well i can't just easily update my people i have to write i don't want to write because they don't yeah. have a remote culture right so mm -hmm. that's the real the real problem um this this monday power went out because Montreal, uh, it snowed and apparently the infrastructure of the city isn't ready for that. So the power went out. Um, and I'm like, well, I can't work. So, you know, go have a snowball fight with my kids for 30 minutes. There you go. Right. Like that's the value of not working from an office downtown was I just got to do that. Uh, that's why I would never work from an office again. I don't think is just the flexibility of being able to do that is incredible. Um, but, company culture is very different as a result so i think if you're building your agency you're hiring up and i think almost everybody who's building a company these days it feels like if it's a knowledge working company you're probably working from home at least half the time and i think you know pull the bandaid off and decide either don't run office space you all work from your bedrooms or from we works around the world whatever or say yeah. we're going to have an office we're going to be in, in in person and we're going to hire people who care about that but trying to do both, I think, is just too hard. I, I think I think it's really hard to to dictate entirely in person today. Um, I mean, I, I have I have a friend who worked at a works at a big company, right? It's a huge financial institution, um, and she used to be entirely remote up until you know X. Uh, and next thing you know, it's got to commute, you know, two hours to the nearest office for a week, a month. And, the, and it, it, they're going to lose that talent, yeah. right? Yeah. That company is going to lose that talent. Straight up, there's no way that's a sustainable thing for a person with a family. No. And and like that moment being able to say, hey, you know what? The power's out and you're home so you can have that snowball fight with your kids. Like that's actually a moment 
and a memory that you get to make because you're remote. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think, you know, one, one of the quotes again from, from a mentor of mine that really sticks with me is the only people that will remember that you worked late are your kids. Yeah, that's it. It's not going to be your boss. It's not going to be your peers. It's not going to be, you know, your, your, whatever it's going to be. It's going to be the, the people that you ultimately will spend the rest of your life with, yeah. you know, <laughs> like as, as offspring, like in, in being able to find those moments and create those moments and give those moments to your future hires like that. that I think that's really what the agency, um, the agency lifestyle allows you to do. Yeah. And it does, uh, Building a company culture where you're okay with that, I think, is also um, your job as the founder, right? And, and unless you don't want to, then don't. But I think a, a good founder, a wise founder who wants to be in it for the long haul, right, should expect you're building a, a company for people who have lives and families and stuff outside of your business, whether they're remote, whether they're all in the same city, but working from home half the time or more, you know, I got a message from my designer today. Hey, uh, after the cyclone hit in India, everyone in my house has been sick because of humidity. I'm not going to be very good today. I'm like, get better brother. Right? Like whatever. What, what's the stuff you should have delivered today? Yep. Am I going to get it? Nope. Life goes on. Right. Yeah. And, and being able to, and him knowing, right. That if I'm like, Hey, I get it we'll shift deliverables or if we have to, I'll do design work that you will regret seeing once it's live. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, but that's, it, that's at least an honest conversation, right? You, you have that, you can have that dialogue and it's not yeah. riddled with fear of being fired or riddled with uh, just no. half truths. Like, Hey, I, I can't quite make it today. Right. Like, like at least you're getting the full story and it makes sense. Right. Like you're, you, you have a real relationship with these people. And I, I think that, um, creating an environment that you can have that open dialogue, having that trust, especially with a new hire. Um, it's just a critical moment in the trajectory of your agency because the first couple of hires are the ones that are going to perpetuate that cycle of being able to build team. trust and communicate. Yeah. It, and it's not going to be, it can't be you. And your ability to scale and grow requires it to not be you. And the mm -hmm. faster you can build that culture for people, other people to, to uh, instill those values at, at your company, the better you'll be able to, you know, step back and allow the machine that you're, you're building um, to operate. It's, it's really, you know, it's just part of the process. It's hard for a lot of people. It is. Giving away anything can be real hard for a founder. Um, Including decisions. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm still, I'm not great at that myself still. It's a small team. I can get away with it for a while longer. Yeah. All right. You kick the habit eventually. <laughs> someday. Maybe. Someday. I, I suffer from the, the burden of, uh, I, I know how I want it to have been done only after it is finished. And then I'm like, oh, that wasn't even me sometimes. Oh, that wasn't how it should have been. Well, crap. You you better talk to the, the fool who hired the me who did that. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, Tom, as always, I really appreciate it. I suspect we won't do uh, two weeks out because that'll be basically Christmas. Uh, yeah, we, we might. We might. We might. Um, I, I'll, I'll probably be on uh, December 20th. I'll probably be on. December um, 20th? Yeah, I'll still be on. I'm, I'm taking off on the 22nd. I, we're we're like on the edge of hitting a huge milestone, Trevor. It's huge. Five thousand subscribers wow. this year. We're gonna hit five thousand this month. We're like wow. right there. Yeah, right I, on. I just right passed five k on LinkedIn. I now have five thousand and ten as of today on LinkedIn. Woof. Woof. Uh, nice. And on YouTube, I have thirty five. Not thousand, okay. just thirty five. <laughs> yeah, that that's okay. That's okay. We started the year this year at three hundred and twelve. There you go. So we're, go. we're getting more subscribers per month than we had in our first two years as a YouTube channel. That is awesome. Congrats to you. Uh, I can't take any of the credit for it, but I'm going to pretend I can anyway. And, Thanks. You're uh, welcome to it. <laughs> the mustache. It's all the mustache. <laughs> and uh, I will see you, if nothing else, when we do reconvene on the 20th. Uh, I'll have to wear a Santa hat and have eggnog. I might do that also. There you go. Eggnog's supposed to have rum in it. 
I, I, I thought all eggnog did. Uh, seven-year-old me didn't know that, and 18-year-old <laughs> me was scandalized to find that out. <laughs> all right, dude. Have a good two weeks. I will see you in a while. See ya. Bye-bye.